June 16th, 2021 edition of the Urban League Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series brought to you by the National Urban League. I'm your host, Kenneth L. Johnson, president of the Harlem, New York-based diversity recruitment firm, East Coast Executives. If this is your first time joining us for the Digital Career Success Series, welcome. The DCSS is a professional development series that helps members of our Urban League Young Professionals chapters and other diverse job seekers develop new skill sets that will enhance their careers through digital platforms, such as webinars and Facebook Live. The goal is to provide an opportunity for professional development right from one's computer. Today's Digital Career Success Series, Imposter Syndrome, features two amazing panelists. They include Nicole Smith, life coach, executive coach, and founder of Smitten, and Marcus Cooper, award-winning global DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion leader at Zendex, Zendesk, today's sponsor. Nicole Marcus, welcome to the UL Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks. And really appreciate both of you coming. You know, I want to share with the audience and share with you guys. We have an amazing audience. They ask a ton of questions. Uh, they get excited about the content. I'm sure today people are really invested in this topic. And uh, just based on the conversation we had, I think it was earlier in the week or the end of last week. These, these weeks are just merging. But I, I think you guys are going to deliver an extremely um, information-packed, discussion. Uh, Marcus, if you don't mind, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, of course. Hey, everyone. Marcus Cooper here, uh, Director of Global DEI at Sendesk, uh, based here in Harlem, New York, native New Yorker. So anyone out there from this city, uh, great to connect with you through this platform. Excited to be here. Really appreciate the partnership uh, with the National Urban League, which has been part of the Zendesk family for a while now. So excited to get talking. Welcome, Nicole. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and Smitten. Yeah, well, hi, I'm Nicole Smith. Like you said, Kenneth, I am an executive and life coach. I um, stepped into this career after many years as a sports and entertainment marketing executive, um, worked for companies like Walt Disney Company, NASCAR, Major League Baseball, and was a CMO of a WNBA team, but decided to take my talents in a different direction. So now I help high, high achievers and high performers live their best life. You know, every time I hear you mention your background, I just get more impressed. That's an amazing, amazing background. Kudos to you. Um, Marcus, I want to start with you. And, and Nicole, I'm going to pose this question to you as well. But Marcus, let, let give everyone your definition of imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. I, I like to think of it as uh, essentially your inner saboteur. You know, it's that part of your psyche that sort of eats away your confidence, says you're not good enough you're undeserving, um, you know, it says that you're not qualified. The irony is that none of these things are true, right? These thoughts are not rooted in your actual accomplishments, your accolades, your growth, your development, your skills, rather they're rooted in insecurity. You know, they cause many of us, particularly people of color and, and overachievers, as was mentioned earlier, to start to sort of doubt our abilities and, and discredit our accomplishments. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't know how many of you played sports, but I did. Um, I was an athlete growing up, played basketball. I was also the coach's kid. So, you know, there was a lot of pressure to be great, um, which, which I was. I worked really hard for it. Um, but, you know, many of you probably know much of basketball is psychological, right? So I vividly remember uh, playing a tournament in Indiana, and uh, the semifinal round was against a team we had played many times at, at different tournaments in the past, um, they knew the strengths and weaknesses of probably every player on the team. And so the guard that was defending me decided to just trash talk me, start to finish. Every play, every point, every foul, every whistle, he has something to say. Um, and I think I played one of the worst games of my life. You know, this player didn't have the skills to stop me. So he was trash talking to sort of take me out of my own game. So every time I missed a shot or caused a turnover, I started to believe the trash talk, right? And so I'll just go ahead and skip to the end and say, we did win the game. We won the game by a couple points and I led the scoring, but I felt like complete garbage <laughs> after the game. I sort of uh, felt that I had let the team down, that I made it more difficult for us to pull out the win because I played so poorly. Um, and, you know, I just felt like I didn't deserve to be on the team. 
Um, and that's a little bit how imposter syndrome works. It sort of tricks you into believing you don't deserve to win, even though you've been the leading scorer all along. You know what? Let, let's stay there just for a second, because I want to kind of take this into like off the basketball court and into the workplace. So after that situation, right, did you speak to your to, was your father the coach of that actual team? Yes, he was. OK, <laughs> so so let's just say instead of coach, let's say manager or, you know, director or boss, whatever you want to call it. Right. Did you speak to your father about how you felt in that moment after the game? I absolutely did. He came to me as he did. My, my father was a very stern man and uh, was a great, great inspirational leader. We spoke about it and he saw it. He saw it happen. Beginning, we stepped out on the floor. He saw the trash talk escalate. He saw my play start to deteriorate. And I think if we sort of apply this to the employee manager relationship, the right manager who's leaning in and listening and really paying attention to what's going on on their team can identify when you're disengaged, right? They can pick up on um, your performance starting to slip or you feeling t- or you starting to sort of withdraw from the greater team or the community. And I do think your manager has as much responsibility in that dynamic as you do in terms of making sure you feel safe and supported and that you can deliver your best work. Um, So I'll pause on that because I know we're going to get to the question a little bit later on, but I will say it's definitely a two-way relationship. And I can talk about some of the tools I personally use to manage imposter syndrome in my own life. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Nicole, I'd like to get your definition of imposter syndrome. Sure. Well, imposter syndrome, from my point of view, is any time that you're that you're feeling like you don't belong where you are. Right. You feel like you don't deserve this. Somehow you just ended up here. And your greatest fear is that people are going to realize that you're not supposed to be here. You're going to be outed and that you can't actually perform at the level that you've been placed. Um, And it shows up in so many different ways. And I know we'll talk about all of the different ways that, you know, someone might see that. It's often confused with just being a perfectionist, feeling like you have to do everything perfect in order to deserve your spot. Maybe feeling like you ended up there because of luck, all of which to Marcus's point is untrue. Imposter syndrome was actually discovered or discovered, right? In 1978, two women did a study that was based purely on women, um, them feeling like they didn't deserve to be there, although they have been put in positions elevated within their companies or organizations. And this is ongoing. And over time, we found that not only do women experience imposter syndrome, anyone can experience it. And it's actually quite common. And of course, more common in black people, people of color, and especially women, anyone who's marginalized. And I'm sure most of us can kind of connect the dots on why that may be the case, why it shows up more, but that's essentially what it is. You know, I, I want to stay kind of on your side of this. Um, you know, as we talk about types of imposter syndrome, and, you know, it's something that, that I've looked into uh, maybe over the last two years just to kind of learn a little more about it, because I believe that sometimes people are feeling it, but they don't actually know what it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they don't know how to define it. And the only, the only piece of it that I knew about was kind of like, you know, wanting to be a perfectionist or believing that you have to be perfect. What, what are the types of imposter syndrome? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know if there's any specific like, you know, defined categories, but you'll see it show up in a lot of ways. So that perfectionism piece is a part of it. Right. There's the idea that people are smarter than you, that you don't know enough to be where you are, um, that somehow someone has handed you something, which is a narrative that you might hear a lot. And what you might not realize is your brain is replaying thoughts and things and narratives that you've heard elsewhere and you are applying them to yourself although they may not be true. And that's the one thing that's always the case about imposter syndrome. It is an irrational thought or an irrational fear. So for you to even have imposter syndrome, it means that you're doing something right. And it may not necessarily be a bad thing. You know, I I definitely believe that, you know, there was an article by Melanie, Melanie, I think it's Wilding, and it was in the Muse, right? And I think she spoke about five types of imposter syndrome, right? The perfectionist, uh, superman or superwoman, right? Mm-hmm. A genius, the soloist, and the expert, right? I think those were the five. 
And uh, I think people kind of fall into certain categories. Uh, Mr. Marcus, when you, when you think about imposter syndrome, kind of what types of imposter syndrome do you see, especially operating in the space as a leader of a, of a particular initiative on the, on the DEI side at your organization, but just in any step of the way, what types of imposter syndrome have you seen? You know, what's funny is I, I have seen them all, but I think they tend to evolve over time, particularly within your career. So I think um, more junior level professionals, I tend to see the, the brand of almost, you know, the natural genius, the soloist, right? The, the, even in some capacity, the expert where they feel like, um, you know, they've, they've got to know all the things, they've got to do it by themselves. And if, if it doesn't come quickly or easy, they've failed. And over time, you, you sort of see that start to shift. You start to see a population move into this space more so of the perfectionist or the expert, right? Where, where you know, if there's a 90, if you get a 99 out of 100, you feel like you failed, right? The idea that you've, you've just got to be perfect all the time. And something happens when you hit a sort of uh, senior level within your career where you kind of become that superhuman, you think you've got to be able to juggle it all, juggle it all, all the time and make it look easy. And I think we all know none of that is possible or true, but I definitely believe that your life experience does shape the expression of imposter syndrome in your life. And it becomes increasingly important to manage it. You know, I, I personally don't think you're ever going to remove imposter syndrome, right? I, I, you'll never have it um, destroyed completely, but you can manage your relationship with it. And the, the leaders that I've seen do this successfully are also the most engaged, empathetic, exceptional folks I've had the chance to work with. So there actually is tremendous benefit in deciding today how you're going to manage that. You know, you both have been in leadership roles. And um, even from the coaching perspective, uh, Nicole, so when, when you're speaking with your clients, and if you notice that, um, is it your responsibility to, I, I, wanna, I don't want to use the term confront, because I think there's probably a softer term, but is, the, is it your responsibility to confront it or, and or address it? And then once you do, how do you encourage people to kind of move past it? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, as a coach, it's always my job to show people what they can't see, you know, to highlight their blind spots. And if their blind spot is that they have some imposter syndrome um, swirling about is to show them that. And yeah, in fact, confront it to say, hey, here's some thoughts I see that you're having some things that you're saying to yourself, because imposter syndrome is very much about what you're saying to yourself, that internal conversation, and some things we may need to reconsider and do differently. Right. And so when I do see it in them and to your point, all of those things, the idea that I have to do it all myself, I have to do it perfectly. Um, if this isn't easy, I must be doing something wrong. It seems easy for everybody else. Or even the opposite of that, if something is easy, discounting it and saying it, it must not be valuable because I'm not working as hard as everybody else. And so what I do is I try to put those thoughts in the forefront and actually say them out loud and look at them and ask yourself, is this actually true? Who is telling you that? Where is this coming from? Because there's a difference, you know, self-doubt is always there. We're always going to doubt ourselves, especially when we're doing something new, right? That's natural. That's a part of the human condition. We shouldn't resist it. Allow it, right? But when it gets to be imposter syndrome, it's not only are we having these negative conversations with ourselves, believing these things about ourselves that we don't deserve or we don't belong. And then we're acting on that. So we're engaged in behavior like overworking. We're engaged in behavior that is keeping us from truly being great. And that's when you know it's gone too far. One thing I see that's super common is the entanglement of being welcome and belonging. Mm -hmm. And if I can just get people to understand that those are not the same thing. Being welcome is something somebody does for you or you do for somebody else. Can't control whether somebody makes you feel welcome but you can decide that you belong. So you can walk into a room and tell yourself, I belong here and truly believe that and act from a place of I belong here versus questioning whether you should be there or not. I like that, that's, that's impressive, that's impressive. Uh, so Marcus, let me bring you in. So uh, coming from your seat as an organizational leader, especially on the DEI side, uh, there's always some intersectionality 
and some of the things that we're bringing to work, right? So why is there a higher rate of imposter syndrome amongst the black indigenous people of color uh, or at organizations or just in general? Uh, and I'm not speaking specifically about your organization, but as you kind of move throughout the space and, 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 and speak to your peers, what are you seeing? Like, what, what are you hearing about this being a challenge as far as people kind of understanding how their organization is operating? Wow, that's a, it's a great question. And I, I think it's really difficult to answer without addressing topics like systemic racism or critical race theory. I mean, there, there was literally a time in American history where black people weren't even considered a full person, right? In the late 1700s, the constitution literally declared slaves three fifths of a person. So the, this sensation of us n not being enough or being less than has been neurologically coded in us over several generations and structurally embedded in both the, the public and private sector. So if you pair that with things like minimal representation, um, and I'll speak from my industry in, in STEM, particularly in leadership roles, uh, the concentration of wealth, rather the sort of majority center distribution of wealth. Uh, you add in the sort of organiza organizational trauma that many of us have experienced or continue to experience at work, whether it be through, you know, subtle and ongoing microaggressions or systemic bias and hiring or promotion or just, just a talent experience more broadly. Um, it's completely understandable why we ourselves may surrender to our sort of inner saboteur, right? Uh, almost as a coping mechanism to mitigate the pain of the inequities we experience every single day. That being said, um, because we have the power to change our relationship with imposter syndrome, the organization also has the power to create an environment where um, you can sort of mitigate some of those fears you might have. And so the mention of, you know, the elements of the talent experience, whether it be um, promotion or what have you, um, there are opportunities there at the organizational and leadership level, right? Um, belonging, as was just discussed, is incredibly important because it creates something we call psychological safety, right? And that's what's going to fuel your innovation and your performance. There actually is research that can uh, sort of highlight what happens when you experience imposter syndrome and you pair that with an organization that's toxic and exclusive, your performance will absolutely continue to decline. So there, there actually, there is science to this and there are proven strategies that um, organizations can, can do to make sure you can mitigate some of those issues. And I know we'll get to that in a second, but all of this to say, um, we sort of have to start having those conversations today um, and start setting up those strategies for ourselves so that when we engage with an or another organization and we feel like, hey, we've done some due diligence to identify how they're able to show up for the Black and Brown community, you are setting yourself up for success once you join from day one. Love it. Love it. Hey, listen, uh, for everybody that's on this actual uh, Digital Career Success Series feed, I see the chat is really active. We appreciate that. Also, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Kristen Bray and the team at the National Urban League are back there on the back end funneling questions through. So we appreciate any and all questions. And while we have Marcus and Nicole here, uh, just take the opportunity to uh, tap into their unbelievable uh, knowledge and, and insight here on this particular topic. So let's just go back to this, right? Uh, best practices when it comes to imposter syndrome. And, and let, let's do it from both sides of it, right? So Nicole, I'd like you to speak on best practices that individuals, that employees can kind of follow through on. And Marcus, we'll come to you from the side of the, the employer and what they can do to uh, combat imposter syndrome or to support those suffering from it. Okay. All right, well, I'll jump in there. So there's some really simple things you can do, right? So one of the simplest things you can do is to keep track, record, and celebrate your accomplishments. What do you do well? And I always say, make sure you record not only the external things people can see, but the things that only you know and that you might see about yourself. So make sure you are doing that um, and that you are truly celebrating it and not dismissing what you are capable of and what you have 
contributed in the workplace and beyond. Because you'll need to go back to that in those moments when you're feeling like you haven't done anything, you don't deserve it, it's kind of your list. Plus, as you get used to celebrating yourself, you get more into the headspace and the mindset of, I am great, I have done great things, I do deserve to be here, super important. Then to support that work you're doing yourself, check your circle. Make sure you have people around you who support you and who support your greatness. If you're constantly hearing about how poorly you're doing or that you don't have what it takes, then you might start to believe that because a belief is just a thought that's been practiced over and over again. So make sure you're surrounding yourself with people who reinforce the good things that are happening and who share and celebrate your accomplishments alongside you, right? And then I say the last thing is make sure you're voicing it. Like, don't be as scared. Like, if you're feeling like this is overwhelming and you have this overwhelming sense of like, I don't know what's happening. I feel out of control. I feel like something is wrong. Find a trusted person to talk to about that. And if you don't have someone in your life, um, look for mentors, look for a coach. I mean, I'm biased about that, but that works. If you have a therapist, bring it up. There are people who want to support you and people who want to help you. And it's nice to kind of bounce those thoughts and check your thoughts against someone who's objective. You know, I, I, when I came across some of your content, I think it was, and correct me, it, it's the Tuesday and or Thursday. I can't remember. Was it Talk About It Tuesdays? Tuesday, yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> so so <laughs> Nicole has this thing, and, and if you're not following, following her on social, uh, please do. We'll share that information at the end as well. But her Talk About It Tuesday segment, Marcus, was amazing. And I used to come on just to hear <laughs> what she was telling us to think about on Tuesday from a uh, career perspective, right? And, and just from a really come, being in tune with yourself. I think that's a big picture, right? That's a big piece of it. Sometimes the self-talk is more defeating than anything you're getting from the outside world, right? And I thought that you did a great job of kind of checking in with people and kind of letting them know that they can be amazing and are amazing at what, what it is that they do. Uh, can you share a little bit about your motivation behind the Talk About It Tuesdays and, uh, and just kind of, you know, what that meant? Yeah. Okay. So I guess this is the cue. Bring back Talk About It Tuesdays. Really subtle <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm missing <laughs> it right now. I'm like walking around on Wednesday like yeah. I don't know what to do. I mean, was talk about I've been it. thinking about bringing it back. So now maybe I've been convinced it needs to come back. So listen, for me, this is why I do this work, because I believe that there's not enough um, encouragement and there's not enough people speaking life, purpose, and positivity into us. So much of the narrative out in the world right now is about what you can't do or how hard things are. And I'm in this place where I want you to know that it can be easy, it can be fun, and still be valuable. You can be exactly who you are and be successful. You don't have to compare yourself to anyone else. And it's true. That internal conversation, the communication you're having with yourself is the most important conversation that you're having. Because if you're bringing this defeated energy, if you're bringing all this doubt into the situation, that's being read and felt and it's holding you back and it's keeping other people from receiving your greatness. And if I can do anything to remove barriers to greatness, that's a place where I wanna be. All right, we hope you wanna be there on Tuesday. Tyler, <laughs> Tyler, came into the chat. <laughs> Tyler came into the chat and said, bring me it back. So that's two. We got two people. Uh, <laughs> oh, we got more. And I people. want I want those two likes every week. You hear me? Both of them. <laughs> we got you, Marcus. I want to come back to the original question. I know I got sidetracked, uh, encouraging Nicole to to bring back the Tuesday conversation. But uh, how how do we, as leaders, organizationally combat imposter syndrome? So poor, poor Nicole has been bamboozled. This has actually been a, a scam to, to, get the, to get her content back online. We set um, her up. We set her up. We, we walked her right to it. Uh, and, and, be, and before I answer that, I want to highlight another thing that uh, Nicole said, which was around therapy, uh, which I am a tremendous advocate for. I'm on the board of a company called Violet that is um, matchmaking service for therapists and potential patients. I I'm in a group called Black Men Go to Therapy. It's absolutely the best investment you will ever make in your life. Please go and do it. End of my infomercial. <clears throat> anyway, so I, I definitely think employers have a responsibility to create the conditions in which all identities, um, especially the those who are underrepresented, can find 
both success and wellness um, in, in their workplace experience. When it comes to imposter syndrome, I believe that means removing the potential um, sort of psychological barriers or more simply debunking the common fears or triggers around imposter syndrome before they can take hold. Um, so, you know, a, a few that I'll highlight are around your performance process. Um, so being crystal clear about what success looks like in a role, uh, protecting the review process from common biases, um, you know, setting talent up for success, right? From, from day one onboarding buddies and resources to ongoing support, whether that means through building out your team, um, adding support from the PMO organization, which is truly a lifesaver if you have that available to you. Um, the second piece would be around promotion or career advancement, right? So I think designing very clear career architectures and leadership competencies that sort of clarify how to advance between roles and levels is, is really essential. And, and a lot of organizations are still developing in this area. Um, <clears throat> I'd highlight feedback in development, um, you know, really designing a feedback philosophy and program that mitigates bias. Um, and more importantly, em empowers staff to take action. I think that's really, really essential. Um, the last piece, which I spoke about uh, briefly before is psychological safety, um, which is really about building sort of highly innovative teams by creating a culture that nurtures and celebrates difference. Um, so psychologically safe spaces are great for sort of building belonging and creating an environment where people can share um, really their fears and insecurities in a, in a safe way. Um, and ironically, as, as I mentioned before, the best way to, you know, render your inner saboteur powerless is just to start talking about it. Start talking to your peers and your leaders about, um, you know, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? What are you worried about? Um, because <clears throat> imposter syndrome gets its power from secrecy. Right, it's it's the belief that you are the only one going through these things or experiencing these fears, and thus you keep it to yourself because you don't want to be labeled as incompetent or what have you. And the trick is to to open up. The trick is open up in a safe way. Confide in people who believe in you, whom you trust. This is where mentors and sponsors are really really important. And the more you talk about it, the more you'll realize how common it is the more you'll recognize how unfounded these thoughts are. Um, and actually the better you'll be able to manage it because you'll get to a space where you're like, this is not real. I've earned everything that I've received. I deserve to be here and I can go further, which is even more important. You know, I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna slightly come up the grid here because I was thinking about something uh, that kind of falls right into your wheelhouse. And I think a lot of people on the line, just as I've looked at, who attends some of the Digital Career Success Series content, who consumes it. Uh, we have a lot of people that are DNI practitioners and are those looking to get into that space, right? So mm -hmm. as companies have been more intentional about adding staff for those particular opportunities, you have companies that have never had people in those roles that now have those roles as functioning roles within mm -hmm. the organization, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, think about the pressure that people walking into that will take on when maybe there's hasn't been any precedent for yeah. their, their torchbearers organizationally for something that maybe everyone's not even on board with, right? Mm -hmm. So what resources do you suggest and or offer to individuals that are, one, looking to get into the DEI space and are currently operating in an organization that may not completely understand the challenges that exist? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I don't, I don't even know if we have enough time to go to. <laughs> but, but what I can say is that um, that is a groundbreaking next step. To, to be in a role like that is the responsibility and, and privilege of a lifetime. And it is not your responsibility alone. If, you, if any organization is committed to making progress in this space, number one, they have to demonstrate the intention and authenticity around the work before they make this hire. Do some diligence on that when you're interviewing because it will be important once you join a company. Number two, they've got to align 
at the highest level on the business value of this work. And more importantly, each executive leader on an individual level has to identify their why. They need to know their own personal connection to this work. And guess what? Even if they are cisgender, white, male, whatever, um, they still have some connection to DEI work. They just have to do some self work to find it, right? The last piece and the most important piece is the alignment of resources to sort of um, accelerate progress in this space. And this is one that typically uh, does fall off. You know, what, what's essential to get there is that you as a diversity leader take what you've seen out in the world, right? What you think is, is necessary to use uh, internal DEI as a tool for restorative justice. Take what you've seen in the world, pair that with your own diagnostic with the organization when you join, do some due diligence, and then you go ahead, blend those things and move them into the space where you're aligning with the highest level business or company strategy. That is the number one way to get the right support and resourcing you need to get the work done. So if your company is saying, hey, we want to grow by 30%, guess what? There's also a headcount ask associated with that. Guess what? You have a say in what the hiring looks like, right? You're going to fuel that growth. And that's just one element, but you have to approach it the same way you might approach any sort of business unit or any business function where there is a task at hand and you use your lived experience, what you've seen in the market, what you've seen in the company and where you know the company is going to start solve in strategic ways. And to be honest with you, it took me a long time to learn that. <laughs> it took me a long time to recognize that it's not enough just to listen and hear what's going on internally. You have to bring it to life in a way or, or in a language that your leaders will understand, even if they don't spend a lot of time in this space. And if there's anyone out there who's trying to break into this career and they're looking for some advice, I am more than happy to be that person for you. I promise to keep it real. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that, that's what I think about that. And we appreciate it. Listen, uh, that was a, an exceptional answer and a very layered answer for those of you looking to get this information. If you didn't catch that all, this and all episodes are available on the Urban League Job Network YouTube channel. So you can go there uh, probably, I believe, as early as Friday and even watch this actual episode of the Digital Career Success Series. Thank you so very much, Marcus. I appreciate that answer. Uh, Nicole, from your standpoint, you know, what resources are out there to combat uh, imposter syndrome? I know Marcus spoke about therapy on some levels, right? And, and you're a coach, uh, so, so I get that particular piece of it. Uh, anything else or a particular style of coaching that maybe uh, supports individuals that are dealing with this particular challenge? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm with Marcus. Like ther therapy is fantastic. If that's what you need, you should never be embarrassed, ashamed, or even hesitant to seek out that support. Coaching, of course, is fantastic. Coaching with me is amazing, but you have to find the coach that's right for you, right? It's like a therapist as well. Um, there's all types of people. I think the most important thing is to find someone that you can bring your complete self to the session every week, right? You want to be able to show up and talk about exactly what's going on with you holding nothing back. Otherwise, it doesn't serve you. So make sure you find someone who you're very comfortable with, who you feel understands um, you as a person and what your experience might be. Other resources that are out there, um, look for um, sometimes within your um, employee resource groups, right? Like you, there may be employee resource groups within your organization, look for those. Look for also um, employee assistance programs that help you match you with maybe a therapist or a coach. People often forget to ask their employers about coaching. For some people, coaching is cost prohibitive, um, but employers will subsidize or pay for you to have a coach. So if you're having an issue, reach out to and ask, what is the professional development budget? What is the budget to get an executive coach or some or coach for whatever level that you're on? And don't just assume that because you don't have a VP title or SVP title that it's not available to you. It may be. So ask the question. You have to be the biggest advocate for yourself. And I think there's a lot of um, work that you can just do as far as being aware of your thoughts and challenging your thoughts. Right. So make sure you are 
listening to, again, the conversation in your mind, but I would say there's lots of resources about self-doubt, self-esteem, building your confidence. Um, those are the types of things that you want to be doing to get out ahead of before things become full on imposter syndrome. But if you think you're fully in it, I would seek out coaching something within your organization or pro possibly therapy to help you get through it. Exceptional. I want to, I want to speak with you again about this. Um, you know, I, I'd like to go into how imposter syndrome may have presented some challenges in your own career. Uh, you know, just in looking at your background, and again, I'm, I'm just so impressed and, and just proud of the work that you've done, but you've kind of operated and excelled in very male-dominated industries at some times in your life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that challenge alone, but also, you know, when imposter syndrome rears its head, how were you able, can you speak about any of those challenges and how you were able to, to, to navigate and, and come out on top? Yeah, well, you know what, I'll, I'll lift the veil just for a second and say, it's very simple for me to talk about it now because I've had a chance to live through it, be separated from it. I've obviously done training and work on the coaching side of things. So I've had access to a number of things that allow me now to see it much more clearly, right? But when I was in it, it wasn't always so clear. It's almost trying to see the water that you're swimming in. And I can speak to things that, I think the example I wanna give is one that might not feel like imposter syndrome. So if you're in it, you may not define it that way. So I was in an organization, I was in a leadership role and we kind of had a change in dynamic with new hires. And there was a lot of talk when I wasn't around about my approach to things, basically amounting to me being, you know, uncooperative or potentially being, um, oh, I don't know, angry or unkind, which anybody who knows me knows that I have the potential as does anyone else, but that's really not how I operate. However, it was so easily accepted that that had happened. Um, there was one specific example where someone said I had yelled at them in front of everybody um, when the conversation had actually taken place over the phone and I was actually at home on the phone for this conversation. So there's actually no way I could have done that. But it was widely accepted and I was confronted with it with a, why did you do this? Not an actual, did this happen? And in that moment right now, what I would tell myself or tell a client is that you have to be the biggest advocate for yourself. There's certain questions you need to ask, you need to push back. But I didn't do that. What I did is I retreated and I prioritized psychological safety. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't feel like this group of people, I actually belong. They're gonna choose each other first. I'm not sure if I should be here. So I'm just going to shrink, become a little bit invisible. And maybe if they can't see me, they won't bother me, <laughs> right? Which is so typical and people do this. And I'm not embarrassed to say that I did it because I didn't know better. That's where you see imposter syndrome show up. I don't belong here. They have something I don't have. They have camaraderie I don't have. I should just you know, disappear, right? Don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's the simplest thing I can say. Really learn how to advocate for yourself. Really learn how to push back. And if you need someone to teach you or help you to do that, find those resources. But that's just an example of how imposter syndrome could show up. We minimize, that's exactly it. We minimize ourselves in the space. Because if you really believe that you belonged in that space, that you had earned that spot, how would you show up? And even if you're not feeling that energy in the moment, you have to find a way to get yourself there and just imagine myself as my most confident, my, my best self, how would she respond to this? And then do that. I love that. I yeah. love that. <clears throat> it's amazing. Marcus, you, you've moved around in, in some, some spaces yourself that aren't typically, I'm not going to use the word welcoming, but aren't temp, they're not typically occupied by black males, right? Yeah. Um, how is imposter syndrome played a role or presented challenges for you personally? Yeah, I, I think in a similar way. I mean, I, I can recall once being in a DI leadership role um, within a company that actually had built a pretty substantial external brand around this work. And so I took the position feeling like I'd be empowered uh, and sort of supported to, to do my best work. And it turned out to be one of the more toxic <laughs> and discouraging professional experiences I'd ever have. Um, everything from, you know, 
the, the strategy to my approach to programming was scrutinized at every possible step of the way. And so I, I, it sort of made me doubt myself. Um, I did feel like a little bit of a failure. I felt like a lot of folks down. Um, and so I started to shrink, of course, and I, I watered down my ideas to sort of appease some of the leaders. And after a few years, I, I did have the courage to leave. And, um, you know, when I landed at my new gig, I, at that time, just had the total opposite <laughs> experience. I mean, I joined an organization that was uh, deeply committed and could demonstrate that commitment through, you know, resourcing and strategic alignment and, and all the pieces I talked about before. And, and at that point, I really had to unlearn um, so much from, from the previous role in order to think bigger, to dream again. Um, and I made a promise to myself at that time that I would never shrink, right? That this role requires giants to shake the foundation of culture. And so, you know, I consider myself a servant leader. And as a servant leader, I, I owe that to my team, to the employees that I support, to myself and others to, to just bring the entirety of my expertise to the table. Wow, man, you know, your communication style is very appealing. I, I, I know you come off well when you speak about, um, you know, best practices and initiatives and things of that nature organizationally, because I think you're, you, just from this today, I can real, I realize, and actually I saw it when we spoke last week, but, but you both actually do a really good job of, of communicating with transparency and, and, and caring behind the words. And I think that comes off extremely well. So I hope everybody that's on this particular feed right now is understanding and feeling that. And I'm sure they are, because as I look at some of the questions here, I have one for you, Marcus. So uh, they say in response, in response to Marcus, what if we experience a lack of support from our organizational leaders in regards to providing resources and conditions to best support us? I have an answer to that that is not going to sound as fluffy and fun. <laughs> I, I think we can take every step to explore the options that are available and um, leverage the triggers you have to even demand those things in certain circumstances. And you have the power to take your talent elsewhere. And that last piece was kind of tough for me. <laughs> I'm like, I, I am fiercely loyal and very committed to my work. And those things can also be true without having to suffer through traumatic experiences at work. So I, I don't want anyone out there to feel like you are trapped in a role that doesn't support your well-being. You're not going to produce for any organization where you're not well. Um, and I would encourage you to use your network, use your resources, see what's out there. Because uh, what I know is that the firm is going to be loyal to shareholders more times than not. And so you have to be loyal to you and, and the people in your life who you're accountable to. So I know that sounds so fun, but that's just how I live my life. Yeah, it makes complete sense to me. Uh, great answer. Nicole. Uh, do you think the pandemic has helped or hurt imposter syndrome? And let me finish here. Uh, do you think the new virtual world we're living in will pose new challenges for imposter syndrome in the workplace? I'm asking you this question because you spoke about a situation where you were accused of something that happened over a phone call, right? So we're in this virtual world where we're kind of often not communicating face to face and things can kind of be perceived as something that they're not. So kind of, how do you think that's going to be impactful to and or for imposter syndrome? Gosh, I think this is probably a very individual kind of experience and answer, but I'll try to tackle it from two sides. One, I think if you are still working from home, right, or you'll continue to work from home, not going back into an office environment just yet, one of the advantages that you ha have is that you are spending a little bit more time by yourself. And what I would advise anyone to do is start to get really good with spending time by yourself and using that time wisely to get to know yourself. And not to just talk about all the things you need to do or who you wish you were, but to spend time really like hyping yourself up, remembering what you've done well, remembering what you like about yourself and finding joy in things you enjoy again. 
Because imposter syndrome grows in intensity when you feel your job is all you have, when you feel like what you do is who you are. So you, if you can take the time to separate those things, this is a fantastic time to do that, right? Now, if your job is kind of, to Marcus's point, adding to or exacerbating this feeling of not good enough, you need to examine that, right? And being out of the office and away from the day-to-day is a good way to do that. If people are having conversations and saying things about you that are not accurate or not true, there's a couple of things that can happen, right? Don't be afraid to go and not necessarily um, call people out because that may or may not be the best way to do it. But I think understanding where it's all coming from, understanding who it's coming from. But even before it gets to that point, I always say your best defense is allowing people to know you. And allowing people to know you in a virtual environment takes a little bit more effort, but I do recommend that you make it. So if you have new employees coming on board or even employees that you're now not running into in the restroom or the hallway, make an effort to reach out and have connections with those people. Because people are less likely to believe things when they know who you are, right? And then you can feel secure in that you've shown them who you are, they know who you are, and what they choose to believe is on them. You know, that brings me to something I'd like to talk about. And, you know, it's kind of like, so you're on the plane and they tell you, you know, the flight attendant says, you know, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you, you know, try to help other people, right? Uh, so when we're operating at a place where we're comfortable with, you know, with, with who we are um, in our workspace, but we have friends, colleagues, associates, spouses that may be having some challenges with imposter syndrome, are there any best practices on how you can support others uh, with kind of combating and dealing with this, this challenge? I would, oh, I was like, I'm not sure which was the question for, it doesn't matter. Somebody grab it, I just threw it in the air. Yeah, I was just gonna say challenge them, challenge their thought in the most loving and caring way you can. The best questions are, are you, how is that true? You know, if someone's like, I don't deserve to be here, I, I'm not as smart as everybody else, ask them why they believe that. A lot of times those things stick with us because we haven't challenged them. And once we start to talk about them, we realize that, you know what, actually maybe that isn't true. And if they can't see it, maybe show them how it's not true. Or of course, refer them to a trusted mentor or professional that could help them get through it if it's beyond what's in your scope. How is that true? Asking them that. You just gave me one right there. I love that. I, I really, I'm going to probably use that within the next hour. Like I'm going to put that on somebody very soon. Marcus, any add-ons to that? As always, Nicole nailed it. I, I was just going to say, you know, I think what's helpful for me is sharing my thoughts and feelings and my experiences with the topic. I kind of think there is a bit more of a mind shift a mindset shift involved to really start to manage imposter syndrome. Like the, it, I'll cover two things. First, I'll say, personally, I have to coach myself to not be so hard on myself, right? Like everyone experiences imposter syndrome. My Angelo and Albert Einstein have documented <laughs> experiences with imposter syndrome. I'm not better than my Angelo or Albert Einstein. So I think it's okay for me to work through it myself. And actually knowing that I'm not alone is, is quite helpful. It gives me a little bit of community. And I think it's important for people to learn to make it work for them instead of against them. So um, what I'm saying is that it is pretty easy to feel the weight of imposter syndrome as something that could hinder your success. But I think of this the way I think of a lot of um, sort of psycho-emotional phenomena, which um, you know, there are both pros and cons. There are, there are very real benefits to what you might be feeling, right? People who experience imposter syndrome also demonstrate higher levels of resilience, higher levels of innovation. They report feeling a deep sense of motivation towards excellence and achievement. Um, it just, it pushes people to think differently, work smarter and execute, right? And so I don't think perfection is ever a realistic goal, but excellence can often be sort of defined and measured, you know? So think about how you can change the narrative from I'm not good enough to what does success look like and what steps can I take to get there? Um, and these are just little things that I've been doing and, and sharing with you all in hopes that it might help someone. 
And if I could jump back in there just real quick, because Marcus said something that like spurred something in my mind that I want to make sure that we say before like this whole thing is over, is that if you're experiencing anything on the spectrum from self-doubt to imposter syndrome, know that you are not broken. There is not anything wrong with you. To his point, great people in history and great people in current times, including the people on this call, have experienced those feelings. So a lot of people who are selling things or have an agenda would like you to believe that there is something wrong with you, that you are inherently broken or you are inherently less than. And if you don't take anything away, my wish for you is that you walk away knowing that that is not the case. You are whole, complete and capable as you are right now. Yes, you may have some things that you need to work on. We all have things we need to work on. So make sure you're being kind to yourself and kind to each other. And if you can speak that into somebody and most importantly, speak it to yourself, that's one of the most important things you can do. And speaking about important things, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, Nicole, if you don't mind, uh, please let our audience know how to stay connected with you and your content. <laughs> Me and my content, yes. And the content. <laughs> <laughs> I did not, you know, I had to ask more questions before I agree to these things. <laughs> No, but I would love to stay in touch with anyone who wants to stay in touch. You can find me on LinkedIn. I think that's going to come up here soon. Um, and then you can also find me on Instagram. My handle is at I, the letter M, Smitten. So I am Smitten on all social handles. And I would love to see you there. Marcus, please share the same. How, how do uh, our listeners get in contact with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Please feel free to connect with me there. Um, not so active on the other platforms, but I do have a Twitter account that's got all of like six tweets. So I am trying to get more active there. If you want to shoot me some encouragement via Twitter, it's just Carcass Mooper, Marcus Cooper, but the letters mixed up on Twitter. And listen, Marcus, since, since Nicole's going to have Tuesday lockdown, if you want to do something with them ends, like <laughs> Monday's with Marcus or something like that, Monday's open. Monday is definitely open. You know what? Be, be careful. I have members of my team are on this call, and we've been talking about a little talk show. Um, so you, you may have just fueled the fire a little bit. I, I'm flaming it. I'm flaming it. I'm kind of here for Mondays with Marcus. I'm not going to lie. I mean, Monday you know. Marcus, right? Yeah. yeah I, think it's, I think it'd be great. Talk Coming soon. Uh, and of course, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. You can